Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to review what is the status of Omicron in the world and how are we equipped to face it. We have with us Professor Satyajit Rath as he's been usually with us during this entire COVID period. Satyajit, straight question to you. Omicron has really taken over, uh, at least in UK and US, and also looks like in the European Union. So this is the current state. And already we are seeing the wave actually overtaking the earlier waves in some of these countries. Does it mean the Omicron has been spreading much faster than any of the earlier variants? Well, uh, clearly that's what the real life epidemiological evidence indicates that Omicron is spreading faster than Delta. Although I will come to a couple of uh, nuances uh, for that in a moment. Um, and there is also laboratory uh, evidence that says that in uh, Petri dishes, uh, it also does spread faster and grow faster. So um, there is evidence that its spread is much more rapid compared to Delta. Now, the caveat, the, the sort of uh, nuance that I wanted to point out is that Omicron uh, as a viral variant strain is even more changed than Delta is from the original virus strain of last year. And as a result, prior infection with last year's strain and or vaccination with any of the existing vaccines, all of which are based on last year's strains, is um, already a little more mildly protective against reinfection for with the Delta strain and even more so with Omicron. So whether it is spreading hugely rapidly as an absolute characteristic or whether it is under these conditions where the communities are largely either exposed to uh, last year's strain infections and or vaccinated with last year's strain uh, based vaccines. And in this situation now, Delta and Omicron are competing with each other. And it is in this situation that Omicron e is beginning to take over. Now that's just a nuance because it begins to get at the root of what the pathways are through which Omicron is spreading faster. But the fact that you pointed out is, is supported by evidence now in multiple countries that Omicron is overtaking Delta. You know, even otherwise, the speed at which it seems to have risen is more than the earlier variants that had started at the time when we had the naive immune system, so to say, that we neither had infections nor vaccines. So the fact that Omicron may be facing up similarly, that we earlier infections is not protecting us enough in terms of an infection, repeat infection, we're not getting into serious cases as yet, but the fact that others may be in that sense being you know, less able to spread Omicron relatively has an advantage is one issue. That's how it's overtaking Delta. But even the speed is much faster than what we've seen earlier. Yes and no. Um, we should keep in mind that to a certain extent, when we look at epidemiological evidence in real life communities and try comparisons, we're always comparing apples and oranges to some extent. So for example, we were much more afraid last year than we were this year just before Omicron emerged. European countries, uh, North America had essentially begun to open up because they thought they had vaccinated the bulk of their populations. They had reached this, this uh, um, uh, esoteric figure of herd immunity, some of them thought, and therefore they were opening up. Um, so the conditions under which Omicron had access to potential people to infect may well have been different this year compared to last year. 
None of this is to say that Omicron is not capable of spreading very rapidly. It is simply to point out that when we draw these conclusions, we should always be a little cautious and keep in our minds that there may be contributory factors involved rather than one simple linear explanation. Not an apple to apple comparison in any case because epidemiological conditions are different and because they're different therefore you're taking a number of countervailing factors into account and then to come to crude generalizations may be a problem but nevertheless we are very fast rise of Omicron and the second issue that again here you are I know going to take a nuanced position and if one can help you can't help that that's your profession but if we look at it it, there are two things that I want to bring to your attention. First, let's start with the number of serious cases. Say in UK, we have some information now out of the hospital system because the NHS, the national health systems there are better organized than they are in most other countries. And the figures that are coming out from there is that the serious cases seem to be proportionately much higher among the unvaccinated and this I'm referring to really London hospitals because again the figures are really from London and again these are very impressionistic figures as of now but also the interesting part is in spite of all the vaccination programs booster doses etc being available in London there is about 30 percent almost a third of people who are not vaccinated so that's a very large number, which is potentially there for feeding ground for serious infections, not mild infections, which Omicron, of course, will do. But among the unvaccinated, the potential for serious cases seems to be much more. Yes, um, I'm afraid I am going to start with a sort of a cautious disclaimer. But that's only the generic one to remind all of us together that these are emerging numbers. These, this is all very preliminary evidence and we shouldn't jump to definitive conclusions on their basis. But that said, let's look at some of these propositions. In the first place, there was a suggestion from South Africa um, from real life community spread of Omicron that was supported by laboratory studies from Hong Kong that suggested that the Omicron strain may perhaps cause somewhat milder disease um, than say the Delta strain. In South Africa, it was properly and uh, uh, cautiously pointed out that Omicron was infecting, when it was infecting unvaccinated people, they were all young, non-comorbid people who hadn't gotten access to vaccines. And when it was infecting the elderly comorbid people, many of them, unusually in Africa, South Africa, uh, uh, it is true that many of them are vaccinated and the vaccination may have uh, quite plausibly reduced uh, severe infections. And therefore, there was this careful argument that while Omicron-based, uh, Omicron-driven uh, infections may not lead as commonly to severe illness, that may not be an intrinsic characteristic of the Omicron strain, but simply, as we pointed out just a couple of minutes ago, the altered circumstances and the altered uh, sort of host targets that Omicron has accessible. The uh, Hong Kong study, on the other hand, which suggested that the Omicron strain grows hugely better in the upper airways um, of throat and nose and so on, rather than deep down in the lungs, began to suggest that if it really grows less well in the lungs, then maybe it is causing a little less inflammation in the lungs, and therefore it may have a somewhat lesser uh, inclination to cause serious lung um, and related illness. The UK data support the first explanation that it is the um, characteristics of the target population that are determining these, uh, the incidence of severe illness rather than whether the strain is Delta or Omicron. But let me point out 
that there is a little bit of a number problem there. If you look at the UK numbers, we are talking about comparing hugely larger numbers of the Delta variant compared to the numbers of the Omicron strain in the UK numbers. Now, that doesn't make the analysis uh, uh, implausible, but it does underline the fact that we are still looking at very, very preliminary data. Um, uh, for those of us who have uh, some level of statistical understanding, um, vastly unequal sample size comparison is always, always fraught uh, and difficult as an issue. Magnifies and errors. Yes. It magnifies it errors. So, so as a result, um, it is true, but we need to be cautious. That's one issue. The, the more practical uh, concern that you pointed to, that the Omicron strain is spreading very, very rapidly in um, Europe and North America in unvaccinated pockets. Now, clearly, that has a biological basis that the Omicron strain spreads very well. But it also has a, a um, socio-cultural political uh, context to it, which is that the unvaccinated amongst us are not um, atomized uh, individuals spread uniformly in a community of the vaccinated. They are small subclusters, sub-communities. Sometimes they are communities of the marginalized, of the uh, disenfranchised, who have empirically well-grounded suspicion of the state, as well as deeply flawed and limited access to healthcare systems, as well as to vaccination campaigns. Um, the poor, the minorities, the, the underprivileged. All of them tend to cluster. And it is in clusters that respiratory viruses will spread. On the other hand, the most striking example, of course, in the United States of America, although European countries don't seem to be very far behind, um, there are clearly irrational anti-vaxxer, anti-science um, groups. And again, those are communities. They are, they are, they are people who live together, who sort of, you know, breathe the same air. And therefore, when we say that 70% of our population is immunized, we've been pointing out on this uh, chat over and over again, that how the 30% are distributed in the community is going to make an enormous difference to the availability of these clusters for very rapid spread and maintenance of growing virus in human communities and populations. And that's, that's, a, that's a very, underlying. That's a, very, that's a very important point that you're bringing out. It's also in a different way. It can also be seen that why is it from South Africa, it has really jumped to Europe and the United States and a simple communication map, physical communication, airlines and so on, would show that Africa is not networked with itself because most of the African countries were ex are ex-colonies and they're better networked to the parent country. And South Africa, therefore, is better networked with UK. And UK is better networked with the European Union and the United States. And this has been the hinterland of Om Omicron growth. Let me, let me qualify that. There is an enormous amount of cross-border transport between South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Mozambique, Zimbabwe. In fact, uh, all of us will recollect the anti-foreigner uh, tensions uh, uh, in, even in the working class in South Africa. Um, the di difference is that we are talking about airline travel carrying infection in very, very contained and Close infection space. amplifying boxes, namely airplanes, over long duration flights to far away countries. And that's what we are noticing. 
are we getting omicron variant evidence from the far poorer countries across uh, south africa's african borders no we're not yeah, but you know, Satyat, you would still see the rise of COVID numbers. Even within South Africa, outside the Gauteng province, we haven't seen this kind of spikes that we are seeing, for instance, in London, or you're seeing in Denmark, and you're, of course, now tending to see you in New York. In fact, even here, it's really the interconnections, the density of the interconnections, particularly, as you say, air travel, which seems to be the first part. But as we know from history, the past few couple of years, that this then spreads slowly but surely in all other places. It's a matter of time. So, so two points. One, a caution to point out that we really don't have um, very strong, robust data, even about basic numbers of cases from many of these countries. And the bus and train and uh, informal taxi-based cross-border travel is quite extensive. And, and it would not surprise me to, if we begin to see either now or sometime later retrospectively um, evidence of case numbers piling up. But let me make a second point that is in agreement with yours and that extends it. And that is, Ever since last year, it has been apparent that closed environments with recirculating air handling systems are leading to amplified rates and efficiencies of transmission of uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 in um, what I keep calling socio-culturally coherent communities, in office buildings, in apartment complexes, in malls, in, and, and, and so on and so forth. And everything that you are pointing out feeds into that plausible likelihood that you have airplanes which are amplifying it because they are exactly the same thing. It's recirculating air. Um, you have um, airports which are amplifying it, and those are in busy urban temperate zone countries in November, in December, and therefore a great deal of community life is indoors in these large settings under circumstances, as I pointed out, where just before Omicron hit, these, these communities had relaxed um, both their worry and their COVID appropriate behaviors, thinking that they've, they've vaccinated a very substantial proportion of themselves. All of this is converging, I think, into these exploding numbers. And to see. support what you're saying, South Africa is having actually summer. So therefore, much less enclosed and so on and so forth. Coming back to the last point, it also brings out that while we are talking about booster doses in countries which have had two shots for 70%, 60%, 60% 65% of its population, the 25, 30% quite often actually are not wanting vaccines or were not wanting vaccines. So it's not that it was because they were not covered, but they, that was a sort of choice that they were making. While at the same time, African numbers, including South Africa and Morocco, which are very good numbers, and some of them also, like Botswana, have good numbers, including all of that, it's still about 7%. So you're really looking at Africa, which is the, if you take the low-income countries in Africa, probably about 2 to 3% vaccine coverage. And we are talking about booster doses for the rich countries. Now, this is going to create COVID-19 scenarios every year if we don't address it. Oh, absolutely. It is um, quite plausible as a scenario, what you, what you lay out. Let me make three points here. Number one, at the moment, we really do not have very robust evidence we have fragmentary evidence, but we don't have really robust evidence about just how much protection against infection and transmission is provided by vaccination or indeed by boosters. There are small encouraging indications that vaccines provide some degree of protection and that there, is, there are a couple of uh, uh, small studies that suggest 
that boosters may increase this efficiency a little bit further um, with reference to the Delta strain, but we really don't have evidence of this. Let's all keep in mind that all vaccine trials have been based on, vaccine approvals have been based on evidence for protection against severe illness and death, not for massive protection against simply asymptomatic or, or mildly symptomatic infection. It is not unreasonable, it is biologically plausible to expect that even that will show some quantitative effect of the vaccines. It is also plausible that against strains like Delta and even more like Omicron, that is going to go down somewhat. But we are working at this point on the basis of biologically plausible arguments rather than really robust evidence. This is one point. The second point is, we know, following on from my first point, we know that vaccines are providing exemplary protection against severe illness and death, meaning hospitalizations and death from the Delta variant. And the emerging fragmentary data suggest that they are also doing a reasonably good job against Omicron. Again, the Omicron evidence is so preliminary that none of these statements can be made with certainty, but clearly the initial uh, evidence is beginning to look like that. Under those circumstances, you'd expect that what you really want to do is vaccinate everybody across the world. Now, it is not at all my case that booster doses are useless. We, if, do I think booster doses can be quite plausibly useful? Certainly. So if we were in the fortunate position today, one year after we began vaccinations, of having vaccinated the bulk of the world with a basic two-dose vaccination schedule, I would have been an enthusiastic supporter for booster vaccinations. But at this point, we have landed ourselves in this utterly unenviable trap of beginning to think of this versus that. We really, really desperately need to, to be able to set aside the either or and to say, we are going to vaccinate everybody and we are going to provide booster doses without regard to nationality, particularly for those categories of people across the world who are at high risk and susceptibility. So it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that instead of really expanding your vaccine capacity, which we had ample time and ability to do, we are talking about either or rich countries, booster doses versus low income countries, no vaccinations or very low vaccinations. This is not the choice we should have been making. The, at least not one year down the line, we have so many successful vaccines in our kitty. So that's something that we will take up next time in more detail. But one warning that I have to give, Satyajit may or may not agree with me, that given the past history of COVID-19, we are likely to see the spread of Omicron across the globe, when and how much is a matter of checking it out, waiting to see what is happening. But given the speed at which is overtaking countries, it seems plausible to argue that it is going to be everywhere sooner or later. And the second point is that if the numbers increase, and it's a simple issue, even if it is one-tenth likely to cause serious illness, illnesses, if, even if that's taken for granted, 10 times a large number will lead to the same result. So essentially, more cases mean even if statistically numbers are less, you are likely to see large numbers at a time when the hospital staff may also be infected and therefore there is going to be less attendance even in the hospitals. So the collapse of the hospital system is the key to prevent deaths and let us hope, keep our fingers crossed, that this time it doesn't hit us as hard as it did, for instance, in India, when we had a huge wave and we saw hospital collapse across various states and, and, and in the country. 
Satyajit, thanks for being with us. We will discuss the vaccine issue in more details, both vaccine apartheid and also vaccine profiteering. Both these aspects probably in our next show and possibility of a universal vaccine. Thank you very, very much for being with us. Do keep watching News Click and do visit our website.